Hello and welcome to Mathematical Image Processing, Exercise 10. Today we want to take a close look at one, of, at one differential operator that we have seen a lot in the past, which is the Laplacian. The Laplace operator is a differential operator of second order, meaning it works on the space of C2, the twice continuously differentiable functions. And it maps the elements of this space to continuous functions. So the Laplacian, defined via this delta, maps a function to the sum of all second order derivatives. As an example, consider the function with two variables x and y that is defined via e to the x times sine of y. If we calculate twice the first derivative of f, we get again e to the x sine of y by the properties of the exponential functions. If we calculate the second derivative of f x y, we get e times the cosine. And if we differentiate again with respect to y, we get minus e to the x sine of y. So if we now calculate the Laplacian of f, we see that the sum of the second order derivatives sums up to zero. Functions of this type have a special name. They are called harmonic functions. From a different perspective, all functions f that solve the equation Laplacian of f equals to zero, the so-called Laplace equation, are called harmonic functions. In today's exercise, we want to take a look at the Laplacian for edge detection. And as you have seen from the upcoming chapter, Laplacians can also be used for sharpening. Let us take a quick recap on the one-dimensional case. On the left-hand side, we see an image U, which is given via um, a sphere. And if we take a one-dimensional cross-section through the grayscale values, we will observe something like here in the second plot. We have a constant value, then comes the edge, then we have a gradient within the sphere, and we have another sharp edge. And it continues again with a uniform value. Calculating the second derivative now helps us to identify which regions of this one-dimensional cross-section can be considered as edges, namely those regions where the second derivative is very large. The last step is something that we don't want to worry about today, which comes from the Laplace sharpening part, so we can improve our original image by subtracting um, a portion of the second derivative. The question that we want to talk about today is how to generalize the second derivative to higher dimensions. Because as seen in this example, images that we consider normally are two-dimensional. So in the higher order, um, generalization, we still want to have a good indicator for edges, like the second derivative in the one-dimensional case. And we also will have to deal with a problem, namely, if you look at the sphere, you will see there are derivatives, or the derivative will also change depending in which order, uh, in which direction I approach at the edge. But our indicator should be invariant with respect to the direction that I approach the edge. This is something that we call rotational invariance, and we want to take a look at the Laplacian and prove that the Laplace operator itself has this property of rotational invariance. Let us first take a look at two simple examples. For example, this stop sign, if converted into a grayscale image and taken the Laplacian, will look something like this black and white image. 
So all edges are properly detected, even the curved ones. If we only take one directional derivative and we take a closer look, for example, at the stop letters, we will see that there are a lot of edges missing. In particular, those edges uh, taken in the x direction are completely missed by this derivative here. The second thing that we observe is that once we rotate our image a little bit, we see that the quality of the Laplacian remains more or less the same, while the quality of the uh, second derivative in one direction differs from the one that we had before. If you look at the stop sign, you will now see that the result is different. Now we are detecting these edges, but they are not detected in a very good way, so they are still very weak. It's important to notice that we would get a different result starting with the second derivative of the unrotated image and then rotating it, or first rotating the image like I did here and then taking the second derivative with respect to the y direction. The Laplace operator, however, does not experience this difference, which is a first observation of the rotational invariance of this operator. As a second example, I brought to you a photo of some bell peppers. Here we visualized the absolute value of the Laplacian and the absolute value of the second derivative. In this case, we have edges with, uh, with orientation in all different directions. And also in this example, we see that the edges are much better detected and localized using the Laplace operator than the second derivative in one spatial direction. So our goal is that we want to consistently detect edges that are aligned with the x, y axis, or, and also those that are not aligned with the x, y axis. So the quality of our output should not depend on the orientation of our edges, meaning we want a rotational invariant operation. Put into formulas, we want to have equality between the operation applied to our image u with a subsequent rotation and the application of our operation to the rotated image. In the following, we want to show that taking the Laplacian as this operation, we have the property of rotational invariance. To this end, we will first prove a lot of single results and then glue them together for the rotational invariance. In part A, we want to prove a relation of the Laplacian with the Hesse matrix or the Hessian. Namely, that the Laplacian is nothing else than the trace of the Hesse matrix. On the right hand side, we see the Hesse matrix of a function f at position x of Rd. It consists of all second order derivatives of the function f. So on the upper left corner, we take the second derivative twice with respect to di direction one. Then in the second column, we take the first the derivative with respect to the first direction and then to the second direction. And we continue this until the dth column where we take the first derivative with respect to the first direction and then with respect to the d direction. So notice that once we start in the second row, we can already copy one of the first values due to the Schwarz theorem. Now the trace is only interested in the diagonal values of this matrix, which I have highlighted green. Recall that the trace is nothing else than the sum of all diagonal elements. 
Therefore, the trace of the Hessian is precisely the sum of the second order derivatives, which is the Laplacian. Part B is a basic fact from linear algebra, namely that the, the trace is invariant with respect to transpositions of the order of matrices that are inside the trace. If we have two matrices A and B, then the trace of A times B is the same as the trace of B times A. Now, if one of our matrices is in fact invertible, then we can also calculate the trace of the invertible matrix, its inversion times H times A, by interchanging the order of multiplication. I have highlighted those matrices that play the role of A or B in the above formula. Now we re reorder in a way that we can multiply A with its inverse, which gives us the identity matrix, which gives us in the end that the trace of H equals the trace of A to the minus one H A. In problem C, we want to show a representation formula for directional derivatives. Recall that we had so-called normal derivatives in the Neumann boundary condition for boundary value problems. So the directional derivative in general works for any direction V in Rd that is unequal to zero. In this case, we calculate the directional derivative in direction of V by calculating the scalar product of V, our direction, with the gradient of F. And this way, we can derive also the formula given in the exercise. If we repeat this procedure again for a second direction U, we can then calculate the derivative in direction of U of the de derivative in direction of V of F by again calculating a gradient of our, um, by calculating the scalar product of U with the gradient of, in our case now, the directional derivative of F in direction of V. This is what we see here in the right hand side of the scalar product. Plugging in, in the color of blue, what we had, uh, had already gives us the formula in a double sum for the second order derivative in two directions u and v. In part d of the exercise, we want to take a look at the bilinear symmetric mapping I get when I take a pair of directions u and v and I map them to the corresponding second order directional derivative du by dv of f. The proof of bilinearity consists of three parts. The first part is showing li uh, linearity with respect to the first component. The second part is showing the symmetry. And the third part is combining one and two to get linearity with respect to the second component. This proof is very elementary. You find it in the complete notes. Note that the symmetry is as we noted before, when we considered the Hessian, a consequence of the symmetry or the, um, the interchangeability of the derivatives because of the Schwarz theorem. Now, every bilinear symmetric mapping can be represented by taking a matrix U and multiplying a transpose from the left and from the right. This is something that looks like a scalar product. 
And in our case, we can show that du of tv of f at position x is given as the scalar product of u times the Hessian of f x times v. Resolving the scalar product gives us the formula from the exercise. That in here we really have the Hessian, we can see is true by plugging in um, unit vectors ey and ej for u and v. For the last part, let us now finally take a look at the rotational invariance of the Laplacian. We want to show that the Laplacian of f is the same as taking the second order derivatives with respect to a new orthonormal basis v1 to vd of rd. This is part two. So we are not considering the special case of a two-dimensional rotation matrix, but the more general case, as it does not make a big difference. If we put in our orthogonal basis into the columns of a matrix U, we get an orthogonal matrix that has the property noted here on the left-hand side, saying that the transpose of an orthogonal matrix is equal to its inverse. If we now see what we did in part D, we can now write the second order derivative that we have also here on the right hand side by a vector matrix product. And we can do this up to the dth derivative. Now, hypothetically, we can also write all the calculations that we did here in a matrix 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 product. This will give us a matrix that looks like the one here on the right hand side. And we do not care about the upper triangular region and the lower one. We are only interested in the diagonal because those are the parts that we just calculated here. And they are given with, um, as the second order derivatives with respect to one direction, v1 and the last entry vd. And that already finishes the proof of the rotational invariance. Namely, if we start with the sum dv1, dv1, f of x, and we sum up until the dth direction, we see that this is nothing else than the trace of the matrix that we have here above ut of the Hessian of f times u. So, but as we saw in part b, this is nothing else than the trace of the Hessian. Because u is an orthogonal matrix, I can also write u transpose as u to the minus 1. But the trace of the Hessian at position x is nothing else than the Laplacian of f at position x. And this is just what we wanted to prove, namely the Laplacian of f equals the sum of the directional derivatives with respect to another orthogonal or orthonormal basis. Now we want to show again what we had um, yeah, formulated before as a requirement for a good operator in higher dimensions in order to de detect edges. We wanted to have rotational invariance. So rotational invariance, let me start from the last part, means that if I have a function f a of x, which is nothing else than f, and I plug in a times x. Yeah? So maybe think of a as being a rotation matrix. So f a means I first rotate, and then I plug it into the function f. So if f is an image, f a of x corresponds to the rotated image. So the last hand side, or la, uh, the left hand side of this equation reads Laplacian of the rotated image. So, and now we can do some calculation that um, 
yeah, in order to save some time, I just copied here for you. You can check it. Um, it's also just a basic calculation with the chain rule. So um, no, no point in going through it in detail. It shows that it's the same as taking the sum over all second order derivatives with respect to our orthogonal um, basis of f of ax, so the rotated image. But now I'm first calculating the derivatives of f and then I plug in the rotation. So while on the left hand side I have the Laplacian of the rotated image, I now have here uh, something like the Laplacian, but now it's the sum of second order derivatives with respect to another basis, and then I rotate. So, and from part E, we saw that um, now, just forgetting about AX, the sum of the second order derivatives of F with respect to an orthon orthonormal basis is the same as, as the Laplacian. And if we compare now the left hand side and the right hand side, we see that we have achieved the rotational invariance. We won't have time to go into details of this part f. Therefore, I just want to highlight this last note here. Because it may seem arbitrary that we consider the Laplacian as our rotational invariant operator. What one can show with um, some tedious calculations is that every rotational invariant second order differential operator, yeah, so an operator that only works with uh, derivatives up to order two, is of the form of a constant times the Laplacian. So we do not really have um, a lot of options when it comes to second order differential operators that are rotational invariant. The Laplacian or scalar multiples of the Laplacian are the only ones. Thank mm -hmm. you.